It's been a wild ride. I mean, um, I don't think I've, you know, suffered for, for boredom. I mean, it's uh, not many people can say they've, they've built billion dollar company. They've gone to Congress. They've been hauled in front of Congress. They went to prison. <laughs> they, they sort of came out of prison intact, you know, and, and still, you know, uh, ha having their head held up high. A uh, lot of things, you know, uh, in my life that, you know, um, again, I, I'm not the kind of person that says I'd go back, I'd do something differently, but I do think it's been, it's been a hell of a ride and I hope it's just getting started. You know, I think that there's still a lot of life to live. Like who is Martin Shkreli? Yeah. I mean, I, I was, uh, let's see, born in Brooklyn about 40 years ago and, um, born to, uh, two immigrants, uh, fresh off the boat, if you will, and, uh, refugees from communist, uh, Albania. So, um, you know, my parents uh, came to America and didn't have any education or any skills or any anything really. And the whole family just sort of abandoned Eastern Europe for the great beacon of hope that America is. And they had their family and, uh, you know, uh, I was uh, just a precocious kid that loved reading, loved books, loved science, um, really loved medicine. Um, my dream was always to become a doctor, uh, you know, try to you know, be a doctor scientist, maybe cure some disease that everyone was worried about or something like that. And um, going through high school, I, I continued to sort of study that kind of stuff. And then I found myself, crazily enough, on Wall Street uh, when I was 16, working for Jim Cramer, the wild, uh, crazy guy we, on TV. We got I got. I guess. I guess. Stop there for a second. So, like, one of the things that's very remarkable about your about your history is that, like. You know, at least from what I what I what I've read, you, you finished high school early, you finished college early, you made you made your first million very very early. You said at sixteen you're working for Jim Cramer, the guy who's on TV, you know, the the stock guy, right? Yeah, yeah. Jim had a hedge fund. Um, so much of uh, I've seen some of your guests and so forth. So much of of the medical innovation is inextricably kind of tied to the financial world, whether it's VC or even more and more hedge funds and private equity and stuff like that. And uh, I got a chance to work for Jim. Um, you know, you don't know much when you're 16, and I certainly was no exception. But, you know, Jim was a really nice guy who I think kind of paid it forward, um, you know, by having me around. Uh, you know, at the time, I remember the, the big stocks that I was looking at were like human genome sciences, which didn't have a business plan, really. <laughs> they they sort yeah, of decoded it like, cost a lot of money, but like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember asking what what was next after the human genome, and the, the company's phrase was the mouse genome was next. And this is sort of like a, you know, kind of a. It was a very valuable company for what it was. It was uh, Solera Genomics as well, which was like oh a, yeah, kind of like the, yeah. If you remember those guys, and I haven't Solera heard actually in a long up, time. Solera. What's funny about Solera is that they licensed. They tried to sort of pivot to to drug discovery, and they licensed Ibrutinib, which was the the BTK inhibitor. Uh, so they ended up kind of like striking it sort of rich. Um, you know, that drug ended up in Pharmacyclic's hands when Solera decided they didn't want to be a drug company anymore. Hmm. Um, so anyway, it was kind of interesting. I started to follow pharma. Jim, Jim liked mostly at the time, like everyone else, tech was kind of all the rage, the, do the dot-com bubble, all that stuff was interesting. So I got to learn a lot about bubbles. Um, well, around what year was this that you were working for him? 2000. 2000. Yeah, it's okay. 2000. So, Can I ask how, how old you are? I think you're around the same age as I am, actually. I'm 40 now, yeah. You're 40? Oh, okay, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, Jim Jim taught me a lot about work ethic. You know, Jim, um, you know, was a great trader. He's, he's maybe less so of a great investor, but he was a really fabulous stock trader. Um, so that's what, kind of why his, like, TV picks are sometimes off, is that, you know, he's he's really he, kind of... He gets a lot know, of... He, I feel like he had the same effect that Drake has when Drake bets on teams. Like, Jim Cramer has the same thing. You know, I'm just waiting for the stars to align and for Drake and Jim Cramer to bet on something, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's hard. So. It's hard to be Jim, you know, getting asked. But he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And uh, he loved I think people, ahead, people, man. I'm sure he makes a lot of great picks. But, you know, a lot of people want to like sensationalize like massive, like, you know, mistakes that he made, like or things that he, he was wrong. What was something you know, it's not like he was a mentor to you. What was something that that you learned from him? Yeah, I wouldn't say like a mentor because, you know, at the time it was like the end of his career. He retired later that year. And he did the TV thing since then. I'd say like the work ethic was was incredible. I think that you know he taught me th what real hard work meant, and that like the forty hour work week that you kind of grow up as a kid thinking, okay, well you punch your clock and then you're out. You know, then I see a real business owner, somebody who owns his own business, a small business, uh, and is up at four a.m. You know, it has the passion that sometimes you know spilled over into aggression. 
um, mm. you know, in, in sort of a, becoming a madhouse that a hedge fund often is of screaming and yelling and, and pointing fingers and emotional, um, really tough emotional business. Um, but he showed me that, you know, you could, you know, take this thing that most people consider boring and, and a drudgery of work and make it something that was exciting and something you could fight for and live for and put all your passion into. And, and as I tried to start pharmaceutical companies over the years, I kind of kept that in mind and, and it, it, it sort of spilled over into me where, where I could really pour my heart, soul into, into a company or business or project. And I think any entrepreneur will tell you that, you know, that's absolutely required, whether it's a med tech company or a pharma company or any kind of company, you have to give it all you've got or you're not going to make it. And I think that Jim, from a really early age, that, that kind of hit me in the face. And Jim, Jim mostly was focusing on tech, but like he liked healthcare. He liked trading any kind of stock, really. But, you know, every now and then he trade pharma. When he was uh, at Harvard, he used to trade pharma. And this was sort of pharma's golden age in the 90s, uh, when, uh, or late 80s, uh, early 90s, when, when pharma was just sort of uh, starting to pick up on drugs like statins and so forth. Pharma's uh, yeah. companies like Merck were pretty small back then in the 80s, and, and they sort of grew to be juggernauts in the 90s. I don't think I don't think Stark Law or Sunshine Law Act existed back then. So the eighties and nineties, like, <laughs> yeah, Med Device and Pharma was just like insane. Some of the stories I hear are just wild. I mean, you, you know? could get a, a device approved with any amount of data. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. <laughs> seriously, seriously, like, 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 there's, you know, sometimes I go to the Med Device conferences and there's these. Um, small little companies that just sell like all these random tools i'm like how are these companies still around they just sell these random tools it's just like they just got things approved and like you know <laughs> they're just stuck around there's actually a book i'm reading called the uh, surgeon salesman where back in the 70s this guy like blew the roof off on the med device industry and pretty much said like yeah like for me to get my device to be used in a case like the surgeon actually wants me to scrub and do that part of the case so i was doing that you know this is a wild it's it was crazy. a wild world yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we followed, I, after, after a stints with Kramer, I worked at a tiger cub hedge fund and then I started my own hedge fund and we actually studied med tech stocks as well. And, um, How you know, so we followed, started that, uh, started that fund. I was 24. Uh, it didn't go great. Um, I started a second hedge fund that didn't go that great either. Um, you know, I, I became, I realized that, you know, I might be a better long-term investor, whether that be private equity or, um, kind of uh, uh, entrepreneurial VC type roles, which are really, really long term. And so trading uh, is just sort of a strange business. <laughs> um, and I don't recommend it to anybody unless you really love stock trading. It's very difficult. It's it's insane. I feel like, you know, you ha it's almost like drugs. Like you have to be like legitimately obsessed with like I've met a few traders and these are the only people that I would see who, I don't know, on a Friday night would be wondering like, Man, what's what's this company CEO doing tomorrow <laughs> for brunch? Like, what what are these? How are they spending their time and everything? It's just like I, I guess if you don't care enough to know what the markets are going to do on the Monday on a Monday, it's just like not a good thing to go into, right? Yeah, I think I think I totally agree in that you you have to have it in your blood. Like, you really have to care about every tick of the stock. And I did better when. I could take a multi-year view and kind of just be patient with my investing. And I ended up, you know, one of the things about the hedge fund business that's really tough to do is you have this like compulsion to trade. So once I quit hedge funds, I ended up becoming a fairly decent trader and a really good investor myself because I didn't have other people's money kind of, mm. you know, uh, hold it, you know, it's, it's sort of a different responsibility um, when it's your own. And you almost get like, you get a lot of these other fears that creep in when you're managing other people's money. But, you know, it's, it's not easy to manage money for a living in general. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, the earlier stage stuff, I could see that, you know, how that helps society, but in terms of the later stage stuff and then trading, you know, you're not really doing much but playing a video game. Like you're sort of like, yeah, you know, yeah. shuffling money around and, you know, the world's not gonna change because you think Medtronic's worth 60 and it's gonna go to 65 and you're, or something like that. Like that's not really, you know, productive use of anyone's time, but you know, there is some, you know, tertiary benefits to it. But anyway, uh, you know, I followed MedTech. I, I followed companies like Align and Medtronic, Covidian, and uh, you know St. Jude when they were still around, and Boston Scientific, and all those companies. And you know, it was a pleasure. You know, it's uh, it's just a joy to to look at all these companies trying to do different things. You know, pharma was um, to me always my kind of calling. But you mm. know, I, I thought about acquiring MedTech companies or, or building a MedTech company. I'm not banned for MedTech, for example. So <laughs> I could could conceivably what? do MedTech. Really, really random question. Like, if you had to pick one, like, what's what's your favorite MedTech company and why? So, so we bought this stock 
in 2000 and we my, my old partner and i were looking back at like our old records and stuff like that it was a lot of fun we bought this old stock line uh way back when and it, it ended up becoming this like 20 or 30 x uh from where we bought it and it was just such a surprising you know thing to, to think that like you know um you know this 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 invisible brace uh could be such a huge success and mm-hmm. you know them and then maybe a close second would be uh, some of the CGM companies um, like Dexcom, you know, like just at a time when like we were all looking at this as like, you know, who really needs this product, you know, and, and if you look at the, like the seven points of, of insulin, um, there wasn't really a great rationale that you needed to be exactly in range at all the time and stuff like that. So it was like it was a little bit of a hard sell. And it ended up coming, you know, this this thing where, you know, they have Super Bowl commercials and stuff like that. It was like it's too amazing. It's wild. Stuff like yeah. really incredible uh stories and then you know we were also short sellers so we would sometimes find these like real real dogs of, of companies medtech is no shortage of kind of fraud and you know kind of crappy companies that pharma has and and sometimes it's you know some of these are, are really kind of hokey companies that sort of want to make stem cells out of some distillate of some like bodily fluid and then re-inject you <laughs> with the stem cells and like you know it's like G- things that are really out of control so it's a lot of fun like hedge funds can be fun you know where you're, you're like looking at all these companies and kind of like you know kicking them around but you know my my calling was was the real innovative stuff and innovation in medtech is, is like really tricky like we i met i have a friend and you know I, I shouldn't mention names but like there are a lot of interesting innovations where you know it seems like in medtech you can kind of be like a mad scientist <laughs> and sort yeah of yeah totally like sometimes come up with something cool whereas pharma has this like very staid like there is no mad scientist in pharma you're just doing like your high, th- high throughput screen or your protac or you're like very established like modality and you're you're like a, a avant-garde if you're like trying cell therapy or something wacky like that but like in med tech it's it's kind of like anything goes and you never know when a screw a simple like design change in a screw could be worth a billion dollars and yeah you know, exactly it's find an interesting do, industry did you ever look into uh like because you're you know, the early 2000s, like you were, you were trading and looking at these things, but what did you ever look at into a surgical? Sure, of course. You know, uh, I had a friend at a fellow Tiger Cub uh, who was uh, their largest shareholder or something like that. And the funny thing about Intuitive is they came public through a reverse merger, basically, which is like... And, and I my, never knew my that. Drug, yeah, my drug I know a lot control. about Intuitive, but I didn't know about that. In the very, very early days in 2004, like, uh, 2005, and, you know... Um, my friend just hit hit that like a hundred x return out of that or something, and I uh, when I went public uh, myself as Retrofin, uh, the biotech company now called Trevere, uh, which recently won its first FDA approval, I uh, I went through a reverse merger as well. We then did a uplisting to Nasdaq, but you know as did Intuitive, but it was like it's a very like hokey kind of like the SEC is basically all but closed off the possibility now, but it's like a it's like a mini kind of IPO. It's like a very like you know, it's usually not a good sign when your company goes public through a reverse merger, but success stories like in- Intuitive or Retrofin, Trevere, uh, and others like, you know, give give hope that, you know, you can kind of go from zero to hero with, with that world. Mm-hmm. So quick, you know, quick question is something, and again, if you don't want to talk about it, that's perfectly fine, but you, you kind of skipped over something that I, I want to ask you about. So, you know, uh, clearly very talented uh, early, early in, in, in your youth. Uh, started working for Jim Cramer Cramer at age 16, opened your first hedge fund, you said, at age 24. Is that correct? So, you know, you you come from, like, extremely humble beginnings. You know, can you talk a little bit about, like, um, you know, when your parents immigrated here from Albania, which, by the way, for people who are not uh, knowledgeable, Albania, correct me if I'm wrong, it's it's like one of the poorest countries in Europe. Um, It is the poorest country in Europe, yes. Yeah. (laughs) So, but when they came here to the United States, what did your parents do do for work and what was your... What what was it like for you being a first generation American with immigrant parents growing up in Brooklyn? Yeah, my parents worked really hard. Um, my my dad worked as a doorman. My mom worked as a porter, and um, my dad ended up sort of um, becoming a manager and things like that. So he started to get you know successful, uh, relatively speaking. I'm still talking very middle class, but he started to to do better. Um, you know, from odds and ends to sort of like. Um, you know, in, in sort of middle management uh, or, or lower middle management uh, of, of a big industrial sort of sanitation company. So, you know, it was, it was uh, I think when you when you grow up poor, you don't realize you're growing up poor unless unless you really have like a mirror to hold up against, you know, because you're hanging out with the kids in your neighborhood and they're in a similar economic situation than you are. I mean, you don't know that 
kids are on Park Avenue, have boarding school, and they're going to, to summer camp and stuff like that. You might see it in the movie, but you figure that's like make believe. Uh, so when I went to high school in Manhattan at, at uh, what I think is like the one of the best high schools in America, Hunter High School, um, you know, I got a little bit of some some self awareness, but even then, I didn't really fully fully get it. Um, you know, until after kind of you know, uh, it took a while for me to realize that. So. I was I was sort of lucky in a sense that I was sort of immunized from some of that, and that you know I I had what I what I wanted in a lot of ways. You know um, I didn't sort of you know think too hard about the kids who had you know houses in the Hamptons or something like that. I, I was so focused on computers at the time that was sort of my main love was computer programming. Um, you know as a teenager, and then eventually when I got into to hedge funds, I, I sort of forgot all about computer programming. Uh, but I, I just kind of loved science and tech and, and, you know, when you're a nerd, uh, so to speak, uh, use that term endearingly, you know, you don't, uh, think about money as much, you know, I think that, you know, you, well, you can sort of be aloof about it. I was going to say, I mean, you, it seems like you, you're still the same way because, you know, at one point, I mean, you were making, you made millions and millions of dollars with the exception, which we'll, we'll talk about the story later of you, you know, purchasing the Wu-Tang album for like, I think two or $3 million. Um, you know, you're. At least I didn't see anything. Um, you're not going out like parting your face off in New York and everything. For the most part, you were at home. Like you make like YouTube videos on trading and on coding and different things. You did that back then. You still do that now. So I mean, you definitely hold true to that. Um, and during this time, was your mother just like, uh, like, do you have siblings? Your mother like was just like a was was a caretaker. Like, what, what, did your mother have to work as well? Yeah, my mom worked twenty four seven. She was just a workaholic. Uh, and uh, my sister, uh, my younger sister and my brother, you know, the four of us were, you know, I mean, we, you know, we kind of like, like I said, if you don't know what you're missing out on, you kind of don't miss it. And you don't get, you know, jealousy or, or envy of the other kids because you have your own little world. Hmm. Um, and I think I spent like a lot more time in Manhattan or a lot more time with, with other kids uh, than maybe I would have thought differently. But even then, like I, I, I was sort of used to like, I remember going to um like a girlfriend's house of, of like a wealthy family and i ended up like sitting down at the table and talking stocks with their with their dad more than i would hang out with them and so like you know i, I was not expecting that right 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 and it was just sort of like one of these nice things where you know um you know i, I i'm still some people call me aloof sometimes now um there's sort of that uh, trope of like the high functioning autistic aloof and I, i'm not somebody who has autism but like there's this trope of like the person that doesn't always get every social cue, which I've been accused of in the past. But I think that you can mistake that sometimes for just an in, in intensity, where like if you love something like the stock market, like you don't think about, oh, gee, well, you know, I'm from the other side of the tracks and I'm taking a Metro card to, to get here. And, you know, I'm wearing clothes that, you know, from Old Navy or something. And I'm here, I'm talking to this multi-million dollar, you know, uh, you know, uh, captain of industry that I happened to met his, you know, daughter in, in, in high school. And did, you don't, you know, you kind of just don't think about it. And you, you want to talk about parents. Stock. Yeah, did your parents know, like, for example, that you went to, like, somebody's home like that? And, you know, what was, what was their reaction? What, what did you your know, mother, think, I'm sorry, what did your, you mentioned your mother worked 24 7. What did your mother do? She was a porter, janitor type type of role. So she would clean. And many Albanian immigrants did that. In fact, the, the office we have on 42nd Street, um, all the, the, the porters are Albanian. And so they, they say hi. And they, you know, I uh, just met one the other day who said she's my fifth cousin removed or something <laughs> and uh and uh i um you know it's a very common job for for albanians over the last uh you know a couple of decades uh coming to america and albanians have subsequently kind of done better and are now restaurant owners and business owners uh mm. in, in america and uh especially in new york uh which is where and, most of them settle through. It, yeah and i want to get you know next to um you know a little bit about about Turing and, 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 you know, the story behind Daraprim and then, you know, jump right into Dr. Gupta. But something I, I want to point out, and I, I'm not sure if like, um, I don't, I'm, I don't know if you do this uh, unknowingly, but like you, you have this remarkable story, Martin. Um, and again, like you've made, you've made some mistakes. I'm not here to defend any of those things, but, you know, at least from where I sit, you know, somebody who came from a very, very poor comp country to this country, right, landed in New York. Uh, your father was a doorman, your mother was a janitor, right, with siblings, and you had these siblings. And then somehow you found a way to express your talents and your work ethic. You worked for Jim Cramer at age 16. You know, where, uh, where did you end up going to college? Did you, did you ever go to college or? 
yeah, I went to college at night and on weekends and in the summer, like any time I wasn't working at the hedge Where did you graduate from? Uh, I went to Baruch College in New York. Okay. City University of New York. Got it. But, you know, essentially pretty humble beginnings. And then you found your way to Wall Street, making millions. You, you started a pharmaceutical company and everything. You made some, you know, maybe some mistakes along the way, of course. And, you know, and again, I'm not here to defend those things. But from my perspective, I mean, you have a you have this wonderful story that, like, it, in my opinion, is the American dream. And I think that's like very commendable. And I'm like, I'm shocked that like not enough people know about this. And the fact that like I had to string this together. So I'm going to give you some like, uh, like, like as a friend, like some advice. You should like package that like explanation about your background because it, it's it's a remarkable story. And I think a lot of people would be inspired by that, especially like. I mean, I'm first generation American. My my wife is an immigrant from Turkey, and like she loves those kind of things. Like I, when I told her about your background, that's why she was like, "Oh, like when he comes on, let me come in and just say hi to him." You know, it's been a wild ride. I mean, um, I don't think I've you know suffered for for boredom. I mean, it's uh, not many people can say they've they've built billion dollar company, they've gone to Congress, they've been hauled in front of Congress, they went to prison, <laughs> they, they sort of came out of prison intact, you know, and, and still, you know, uh, ha having their head held up high. A uh, lot of things, you know, uh, in my life that, you know, um, again, I, I'm not the kind of person that says I'd go back, I'd do something differently, but I do think it's been it's been a hell of a ride and I hope it's just getting started. You know, I think that there's still a lot of life to live and, and a lot of interesting oh, 